just your bad luck to have run into me. It's Haruka. That's my name. I just killed the top captain of the Tojo clan. There's a rumor that our money in the Toto Bank, all 10 billion yen, was stolen. Is this true? Shut the f up. It's time to die. Finally, you guys have no idea how long I've been itching to talk about the Yakuza series. If you've been following my channel for a while, you'll know that I've mentioned the series several times in my previous videos, often throwing in some gags and music from these games. I'll be honest with you, I became a fan fairly recently. It all started about three years ago when I got into the Yakuza series. While technically my first encounter with the series was in 2018, when I tried out the Yakuza 6 demo, it wasn't until the lockdowns when I played and beat Yakuza 0 that I was hooked. Since then, I've been steadily working my way through the other games in the series, playing and completing almost all of them except for Yakuza Like a Dragon and the recently released Gaiden. I actually just finished the Song of Life as I was making this video, and I have a lot of strong feelings about how that game played out, but that's a discussion for another time. A while back, I asked you all whether I should cover the games in story order or release order. While the majority of you voted for story order, which is how I played through the games, after some reflection and reading some comments, I decided it would be better to cover the series in release order. This way we can see how it evolved over time, improved its game mechanics, and get a better understanding of story moments referenced in Yakuza 0, Kiwami, and Kiwami 2. So today we're kicking things off with the original Yakuza on PS2 which, along with its sequel, are the only two games in the series I haven't played. Only the remakes. So this will be my first time playing through the original game, specifically the Western release. Although I have the option to play a translated version of the Japanese release, thanks to a project called Yakuza Restored, I wanted to experience the English dub in all its questionable glory. And oh man, this dub is something else. But I'll save my thoughts on it for the story part of the video. I'm going to try my best to solely focus on this game and avoid mentioning Kiwami or Yakuza 0, as I want to judge it on its own merits and avoid comparing it to those two, especially when it comes to certain characters and story elements. As a heads up, since emulation for this game isn't exactly perfect, even with all the right settings and PCSX too, there's a few graphical and sound issues that will pop up in my footage, but nothing too distracting. Leave a like and comment down below, sub if you're new, and check out channel memberships if you're interested in supporting the channel a little more. And huge thanks for getting us to 50k subscribers. Now let's go ahead and dive in. Yakuza, or Ryuga Gotoku in Japan, which translates to Like a Dragon, is a third-person action series that revolves around Japan's criminal underworld. The series' lead character is Kazuma Kiryu, a member of the Dojima family that serves the large Yakuza organization known as the Tojo Clan. Kiryu is a man of strong principles who follows a strict moral code and values loyalty, honor, and justice, which puts him at odds with the more ruthless members of the Yakuza. Known for his protective nature, he takes it upon himself to help and defend those who can't protect themselves, whether it's friends, strangers, or even enemies. And he's also amazing at karaoke. All those traits combined with his resilience and strength in fights, and the tattoo on his back, has made Kiryu legendary and known throughout the Yakuza world as the Dragon of Dojima. At the beginning of the first game, thanks to all he's done for the Tojo clan, he's close to branching off and becoming the leader of his own Yakuza family. However, after taking the fall for the murder of his family's patriarch, Sohei Dojima, he's expelled from the Tojo clan and spends 10 years in jail. Becoming a free man in 2005, he returns to Kamurocho and soon discovers the Tojo clan has changed considerably while he was locked up. 
Thanks to a conspiracy revolving around 10 billion yen that has disappeared from the clan's vault, an internal civil war has broken out, with several family heads vying to take control of the Tojo by getting their hands on the missing money. Kiryu, thrown into the middle of this mess, will have to solve the mystery of the missing 10 billion yen, reunite with old friends, some of whom are now working against him, help a little girl he meets along the way, and discover her connection to everything that's happening. When it comes to gameplay, Yakuza blends together elements from action-adventure games, beat-em-ups, and RPGs. Since there's quite a few things to cover, let's start with one of the bigger aspects of the game, and that's its combat system. Yakuza has a heavy focus on melee combat, with Kiryu unleashing a variety of punches, kicks, and combos using a combination of light and heavy attacks. Depending on your button inputs, you can chain longer attacks together or knock an enemy to the ground with a stronger finishing blow. Outside of just throwing hands, you have the option to grapple, allowing Kiryu to hold an enemy in place to punch their face in, throw them to the ground, or add another enemy. When your foe starts dishing back, you can defend yourself to block attacks, dodge, and later on parry moves to instantly counterattack. You're not limited to just hand-to-hand -hand combat though, as you can make use of a variety of weapons from traditional ones you'd expect like knives, swords, or bats, to whatever just happens to be lying around like chairs, tables, signs, or traffic cones. Weapons can be bought and equipped before a fight, but they all work on a durability system and will break after being used a certain amount of times. This keeps the player from over-relying on certain weapons or steamrolling all encounters if they get their hands on a rare and powerful one. As you get into fights and start punching teeth out, you'll notice this blue bar under your health start to fill up. That's your heat meter. Once filled up enough, you can perform heat actions. Special moves that do extra damage but need specific conditions to trigger. For example, the first one requires you to be holding an enemy near a wall or some other surface in order to use the heat action that lets you smash their face into it. Others are a little simpler as you just need to be holding a weapon while the heat gauge is full and activating the heat action when prompted. The system keeps combat from getting too repetitive, adds a little more flair to encounters, and help you manage bigger fights. Though you won't have many heat actions unlocked until you level up through the game. Now that you understand what makes the combat tick, how does it actually feel to play? Well, uh, not great. As fun and over-the-top fighting can be in this series, it's a clunky and janky mess in the original Yakuza, and there's two reasons for that. First is that you don't have a soft lock-on. You can lock Kiryu into facing a direction by holding R1, which is handy in one-to-one -one encounters, but not actually lock on to a specific enemy. That means when you start a combo, you'll throw your attacks in the direction you're facing. If there's no enemy or more likely they move out of the way, not only will you miss, but you'll get locked into your attack animation until the combo is done. It creates a lot, and I mean a lot of situations where Kiryu is basically fighting the air and opens himself up to getting attacked. Normally this wouldn't be so bad, especially in bigger encounters where enemies tend to bunch up together, but that's where the other issue pops up, the camera. During fights, depending on the area you're fighting in, the camera doesn't follow the direction Kiryu is facing, instead moving around the arena. You can press L2 to instantly flip the camera in the direction he's facing, but even with that option, the shifting camera ends up creating even more situations of you missing attacks because you aimed in the wrong direction while the camera moved. Effective crowd control is essentially impossible unless you have a weapon with a long reach, and forget trying to switch between enemies to take out a certain one over the others. Your best bet is usually to run to one side of the arena, flip the camera, and wait for them to come to you to fight them more effectively. It's not outright awful, and because the game is on the relatively easy side, you probably won't get killed due to the jank. It's just really hard to get used to, especially if you played one of the newer games recently. Worse in my case, as I was playing Yakuza 6 at the same time. The difference in how Kiryu controls and fights is like night and day. Of course, that game has its own problems with combat, but... We'll talk about that some other day. Swinging back to the heat system, it also has its own issues in this game. For one, the gauge drains very fast, even when leveling it up a few times to increase its duration, so you have a small window to use a heat action. The other is where you can pull off environmental heat attacks can be finicky, as sometimes the prompt to smash someone into a wall or rail won't pop up. So as you move around and try to find the right spot, the guy you're holding might break free of your grip. Also, I didn't even realize this until like the second half of my playthrough, but some heat moves have follow-up actions. 
letting you press a button when prompted to in order to continue the attack and do more damage. But you wouldn't know this because if you press anything during the heat action scene, it cancels the follow-up prompt and prevents you from even seeing it. Even then, when I finally did see and notice the prompt, you only get like a split second to react when you hear the sound to pull it off. It does feel like the developers did understand the issues with their combat system, as there are a few things that try to make things smoother for the player. Like I mentioned earlier, you can buy weapons to bring into combat, being able to equip three at a given time. You can also purchase equipables that can increase your offense or defense. Next is just leveling up Kiryu's skills, which can be done by gathering experience for winning fights and pouring them into one of three options. First you got Body, which primarily increases his maximum health, but also increases the damage he does in heat mode and how far he moves when dodging. Next is Technique, which unlocks more moves and combos for Kiryu, along with allowing him to escape an enemy's grapple easier. And finally Soul, which increases the heat gauge, unlocks more heat actions, and decreases how fast the heat gauge depletes. There's also a final skill called Special, which you can't invest your XP into like the other skills. Instead, it lists secret moves that you've unlocked throughout the game. The first secret move you can unlock, the Roundhouse Kick, is only taught through a manual you can find in one of the coin lockers near the Millennium Tower. It's a move that lets Kiryu kick in the opposite direction he's facing, potentially attacking enemies that are behind him. In practice though, because you have to move the analog stick in the opposite direction you're facing, combined with the camera issues, means you're still probably going to miss. The other secret moves are taught to you by Sotaro Komaki, master of the Komaki fighting style, who shows up during chapter 5 of the story. Impressed with Kiryu's strength but believing his technique could use some real work, he'll approach the Dragon of Dojima about becoming his apprentice. Agree and he'll put him through some training to refine some techniques and learn new moves. Like wielding a sword better to do more damage, punching behind you, recovering quickly when getting knocked down, or straight up parrying attacks when pressing triangle right as you're about to get hit. You have to get your skills in body, technique, and soul to certain levels before he teaches you the next move, but what he teaches is pretty useful and effective in combat. I wouldn't say they're essential, outside of some optional encounters maybe, but they help reduce some of the jank of the combat. Overall, combat is serviceable, but lacking real polish. It really shows its age after almost 20 years of Yakuza games being released that have improved and refined the formula. Let's shift gears and talk about the game's setting, the city of Kamurocho, Based on Kabukicho, the real-life entertainment district located in Tokyo, this is the main location that pops up in just about every Yakuza game and spin-off. Under the control of the Tojo clan, Kamurocho is defined by its nightlife, shops, fancy restaurants and bars, and all its various forms of entertainment. The massive Millennium Tower stands at the center of the city, serving as a landmark that symbolizes the Tojo clan's power and control over Kamurocho. As someone who's experienced this city several times now through my playthroughs of the other games in the series, I'm honestly amazed how big and dense it is in the first Yakuza. Yeah, it's no Los Santos or Liberty City, but still, it's pretty impressive for a game on the PS2. Functioning as a semi-open world, you'll experience the streets of Kamurocho entirely on foot, which isn't too bad because you can quickly move from one part of the map to the other. There is the option to use taxis for quick travel, but only between three different locations on the map. Unlike future games, the city isn't loaded in all at once, so as you move from one area to the next, it briefly stops to load the next screen. In a similar vein to Resident Evil, it makes use of static camera angles when walking around, with the camera's position changing when entering a new screen. However, the camera always maintains its focus on Kiryu, allowing you to keep track of him and your direction in the dense crowd of people. That's the other thing I wasn't expecting either, as the streets really do feel like a busy city, with tons of people walking around living their day-to-day -day lives. There's even a decent variety of appearances among the NPCs, who aren't haphazardly placed either. You notice different groups of people sticking to different parts of the city. While impressive to see in a PS2 game, it's evident that the developers had to make some compromises to make it work as the character models for NPCs tend to be of a significantly lower quality compared to Kiryu and other important characters. The density of the crowds does end up pushing the game to its limits. Even when emulated, there are several locations that will cause you to slow down while walking through them. As Kiryu wanders through the streets, he'll often get challenged by random groups to fights. They'll call out when spotting them, chase after them until they catch up and initiate a fight, 
though you can also outrun them by reaching the next screen or entering a building. It can be a pain in the ass trying to dodge fights, as depending on what street you're on and where you enter from, these random guys are essentially unavoidable. Though much later in the game you can get your hands on an item that will let you avoid fights. While wandering the streets you can occasionally spot something shining on the ground. Interact with it and you'll discover a coin locker key. A series staple, these keys are scattered throughout the city, both on the streets and inside certain buildings. They're used to unlock a large set of lockers near the Millennium Tower. When you open them with the correct keys, you'll find health items, weapons, key items, and accessories with various bonuses and effects that can be helpful in other side content. There's a total of 50 keys to be found, and they can be a bit tricky to locate compared to other games in the series since you don't have the coin locker key detector to make them easier to track down. Additionally, some keys can be permanently missed because they appear in story locations that you can only visit once. Also, and I'm pretty sure this is just another quirk of the emulation, but the glint they emit can be somewhat challenging to notice, unless you spend some time in an area or come to a complete stop. As mentioned previously, there are numerous places to explore and interact with while navigating Kamurocho. First, you'll come across various payphones scattered around the city, providing an opportunity to save your game outside of safe houses and main story missions. Additionally, there are numerous restaurants and bars situated throughout the map, you can enter these spots to dine and drink, replenishing Kiryu's health while also earning some valuable experience points. There's also a variety of shops where you can purchase food, healing items, equipable gear, and weapons. These include the convenience chain known as Popo Mart, that offers basic foods and supplies. Then there's the expansive discount department store Don Quixote, a real-life retail chain in Japan which stocks a wide range of items including those useful for various side activities. For stronger healing items, you can visit the pharmacy, Kotobuki Drugs. And lastly, there's Ebisu Pawn, a pawn shop that sells weapons, armor, and additional items necessary for side content. You can also sell any unwinded items here to earn extra money. As the story progresses, a few NPCs will also show up who sell different assortments of healing items and weapons. Along with a hidden weapons shop you can find by speaking with a specific homeless person. After paying him for the info he provides, you can locate this shop by visiting an adult video store known as Beam. Since we're on the topic of shopping and buying items, now's a good time to discuss Yakuza's inventory system. It sucks. It seriously sucks ass. Kiryu is limited to only carrying 9 items and 3 weapons. And that's it. Though any important key items are held separately from your regular inventory. You'll start feeling this limitation almost immediately as even when you're not going out of your way to stock up on healing items, a lot of fights will end with Kiryu receiving a random item. And since none of these items stack, you'll max out your inventory fast, with any excess things you pick up being sent to a separate item box. The box serves as a means to help you manage your items, but its accessibility is limited in this game. You can only access it at your hideouts or specific key locations, which are spread out quite far from each other. So you're almost constantly put in situations where you have to decide if you want to run to the nearest hideout to dump any items you don't need, run to Ebisu Pond in order to sell them off for money instead, or just throw the item away. It's so damn tedious and annoying, even more so if you want to equip armor to raise Kiryu's defense, as it still takes up a slot in your inventory when equipped. Thankfully, future games would address these issues by increasing your inventory size, and making the item box easily accessible at all payphones when you go to save. Returning to things you can do in Kamurocho, you can entertain yourself with things like hitting baseballs at the batting center, or heading to the club's Sega Arcade to use the UFO Catcher Claw game to try and win a plushie, which feels just as awkward and rigged as it does in real life. If you're looking to make some cash, you can do a little gambling later in the story at the Fukuma Casino, or at a hidden casino that can be discovered during a sub-story, buy some casino chips, and bet it all on blackjack, roulette, baccarat, or pachinko, and then use your winnings to buy items from the casino shop, either to resell for lots of cash or to deck yourself out with some really good weapons and items. Since gambling is all luck-based, outside of safe scumming until you can win, you can increase your odds at the different games by finding or buying items that increase the chances of certain outcomes, if you're in the mood for some more adult entertainment, you can hit up the strip club Asia and watch some scanning clad ladies dance on stage. Need something a little more intimate? Well, why not hit up a cabaret club like Club Shine or Club Jewel instead? 
Cabaret clubs are a staple of the series, and again, I'm left baffled that they've been here since the very beginning, as I could have sworn it was something introduced during the PS3 era. Also referred to as a hostess club, it's a type of nightclub that primarily employs female staff who cater to men looking to drink and chat up some pretty ladies. There's also host clubs, with male staff members catering to female clientele, which also pops up in Camarocho in the form of Stardust. Not sure what the western equivalent to a cabaret club is, was going to say a strip club, but Japan has those too, and it's not really the same. I guess something like a Hooters maybe? Or a bar with a hot bartender? I don't know. When Kiryu visits a cabaret club, he initially gets paired with a random girl. However, you have the option to request a specific girl if you know her name. You can learn the names of the various hostesses available for romance by visiting MEB, and talking to a guy who provides the info. Additionally, by talking with NPCs around Kamurocho, you can learn more about these girls, like what they're into or dislike. Once you've made your choice and are seated with a hostess, you'll have the opportunity to order alcohol and food while engaging in conversation with her. These interactions essentially function as a romance minigame, where you can increase a hostess's affection for Kiryu by selecting the alcohol and food she prefers, answering her questions correctly, and giving her gifts, with some equipable items increasing their affection too. They'll email you after each encounter, and after maxing out their affection, you'll unlock a substory related to each girl. Complete the substory, and the screen will transition to the hotel district with the hostess saying they like Kiryu, implying my man got lucky, and he showed them why he's really called the Dragon of Dojima. Or maybe they went on a lovely date. Who knows? Both seem just as likely with a guy like Kiryu. Each substory with a hostess ends with a huge experience boost, and Kiryu getting a lovely photo from his new lady. But due to the time and money investment, it's not really all that worth it to go through romancing all the hostesses, even with the experience boost. Which is why I didn't bother going through them myself, especially since it's not necessary for 100% completing all the sub-stories. But it's a fun little distraction. I'm way more into managing the actual hostess clubs like you can in future games. Now I was going to go over the Underground Coliseum next, but I'm going to save that for the story portion of the video after it's unlocked later. Instead, let's talk about the biggest piece of side content in Yakuza, the substories. Referred to as missions in this game, substories are small little side quests that slowly appear throughout the main story with over 72 of them in total. Unlike some future games, substories aren't marked on your map and you'll only stumble upon them by talking to the right NPC or being at the right place at the right time. For example, the first substory you'll encounter is in Chapter 2. Near Theater Square is a woman in pink walking back and forth. Bump into her and she'll accuse Kiryu of groping her. Her boyfriend will walk up and demand Kiryu pony up some cash to keep them from reporting him. And if you don't pay, you'll beat the guy up instead and learn it was all a scam to extort people. Completing sub-stories will net you experience points, with some also rewarding money or items. The complexity of these side quests varies wildly. Some are as straightforward as defeating a group of thugs who are harassing someone, or obtaining an item that an NPC wants. Others are more intricate, featuring their own voice cutscenes, dialogue choices, or multiple steps that need to be completed in order to finish them, with later substories only unlocking if you completed certain ones first. Now, I'm not going to go into every single one of these, as this would end up ballooning an already long video, and most are as simple and brief as a random fight but I'll go over some of the fun ones that I liked, had some nicer stories attached, or give a decent reward for completing them. First is the sub-story, The Price of an F-Cup. A busty girl named Mai will run to cure you for help as some drunk is harassing her. Hey, asshole! My chance mine! You better watch your mouth. What? You think I'm scared of you? Get lost, you worthless drunk! Fuck it! I'm not interested in that skank bitch anyway. After scaring the guy off, Kiryu can take up Mai's offer to go out for drinks as thanks for helping her. At the bar, the girl really lays it on thick, trying to seduce Kiryu and pushing him to drink the alcohol the bartender served. Denying her request three times, the bartender will get pissed and Kiryu will get wise to the fact that it was all a setup to try to drug and rob him. Fighting the bar staff and the drunk from before who was also in on the scam, the bartender will apologize and offer to pay off Kiryu for the trouble they caused. You can take the money, but if you refuse, the bartender will tell you about a secret casino hidden under a ramen shop, and tell you the secret code to give in order to access it. 
which while pretty cool to discover, and especially since you can access it a few chapters before the other casino, you can end up permanently missing it if you take the payment instead, which also ends up locking you out of two more sub-stories that take place there later. Next is the rather sad sub-story, My Son, where Kiryu will encounter an old man named Gen, who mistakes him for his long-lost son Kenji. If you play along, the old man will ask you to meet him later near the children's park on the west side of the map. Visit that location later and you'll find a friend of his instead, who will get a call from old man Gen, who is being attacked in the champion district. Run there to help, he'll tell you where the guys who jumped him went, and after beating their faces in and getting his wallet back, you'll return to see Gen is gone and his friend there instead. He explains that Gen was taken to the hospital and gives Kiryu the family photo that was in his wallet, knowing that he really isn't Kenji. The bum explains that Gen's son went to a poor country as a medical volunteer and hadn't been heard of since, most likely having died. Knowing his son probably did pass, Gen wanted to believe Kiryu was him, since they look so alike and as a way to help cope with his loss. And finally, there's the sub-story, The Doctor, which starts when you talk to a hungry little boy hanging outside of West Park, give him something to eat, and you'll encounter him again a few chapters later at the park near Stardust. Speak to him, and he explains he's wandering around waiting for his mom to get off work, and you'll need to give him something to eat again. This time he collapses due to intense stomach pain, and you're on the clock to get him somewhere to get treatment before it's too late. Talk to a guy near Stardust, he'll tell you about a clinic not far from your location. Run in and the doctor inside will stop looking at his current patient Ali and help the kid, who is suffering from an appendicitis. After Ali seemingly dies, his brothers will get angry and claim the doctor was being racist for helping Kiryu and the kid when they were there first. Fight the two brothers, the doctor will successfully complete surgery on the kid and reveal Ali is fine. He was just passing a kidney stone. Kiryu thanks the doctor for his help, who will keep an eye on the little boy and contact his mother to come and get him. The doc also tells us his backstory about how he opened his clinic, and how he's been able to keep it running due to the help of his benefactor. Which, after Kiryu leaves and the sub-story ends, turns out to be Kiryu's adoptive father and boss in the Tojo clan, Shintaro Kazuma. There's two other sub-stories I want to discuss, but I'll bring them up later as they both tie directly into the main story. Substories tend to be my favorite part of any Yakuza game, as while they vary in quality, they usually have some interesting stories and memorable characters attached to them, and are worth doing as a way to level up or unlock some rewards. It encourages you to explore the map and keeps Kamurocho from feeling barren and empty by giving you more to do. My only gripe with them in this game is that they aren't marked off on your map to find or continue. All you get is a missions list on the start menu, but with the longer ones, they don't really tell you where to go next if you forgot. Normally, this wouldn't bother me, but there are several sub-stories that can only be done in certain chapters. So if you proceed with the story without finding them, they're gone completely. Since nothing in the game will tell you this, it's extremely easy to lock yourself out of finishing all of them unless you're using a guide the entire time. Which seriously sucks, as the final sub-story only unlocks after completing all the other ones. Minus the hostess romance stories. Titled The Last Assassin, a man in black will appear in front of Theater Square and challenge Kiryu to a fight. This is Joe Amon. He serves as the game's secret boss and is the most difficult opponent in the entire game. A prideful man obsessed with proving how strong the Amon family is, he's a ruthless killer who boasts that no one has ever survived encountering him. Other than Kiryu, of course, as in subsequent games he and his various relatives will butt heads with the Dragon of Dojima and his friends each game's final sub-story being encounters with the Amon clan. Fights against Joe and his family demand absolute mastery of the game's fighting mechanics, being fully leveled up and unlocking most of the hitting moves to even stand a chance. That and you'll usually need whatever the game's equivalent of the best weapons and armor are. Oh, and uh, tons of health items. So unless you're an elite super gamer who can beat these games on legendary mode using no weapons and taking no damage, you're in for a real challenge. The Amon family tend to have tons of health, can guard or escape most of your combos, and have a lot of cheap moves that can interrupt your attacks or can kill you in no time if you're not prepared. Full transparency, I've pretty much never gone through the trouble of unlocking and fighting them, this game included. This time around, it's because I didn't really have enough free time while recording Yakuza to do every side quest and because I screwed up and didn't do a few of those missable sub-stories when I was supposed to. 
When it comes to the other games, I always ended up running into this pattern where I was keeping track of and doing the sub-stories, get close to completing all of them, but reach a point in the game where I just want to finish it and see how it ends. Nothing to do with the quality of the other Yakuza games, mostly, but just a bad habit of mine where I'm juggling multiple games at once, including whatever I'm reviewing for the channel, and I just want to finish and play the next thing in my backlog. I did actually unlock and fight the Amon clan in Yakuza 5, and holy shit was that an overwhelming experience. I had to come back to complete it after I beat the story and could properly prepare for it. It was pretty funny that even Haruka got wrapped up in the feud, and ended up in a dance battle against Noah Amon, whose cover of so much more I might actually prefer to the normal version of the song. So yeah, I love sub-stories in Yakuza. There's side quests done right that avoid feeling too repetitive, have interesting stories, good rewards for completing them, and it's worth doing all of them in order to unlock those challenging secret boss fights. As I continue to cover the series and learn to manage my time better, I'll work towards doing all of them and fighting the Amon clan for the sake of these videos. No promises I'll actually beat all of them, but still. Alrighty, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and dive into the story and experience the glory that is the dove for Yakuza 1. After the opening cutscene, we go back a day to Kiryu helping his friend and underling Shinji collect a debt owed from a local business. Shinji views and addresses Kiryu as his aniki, which translates to older brother in Japanese but in the context of the Yakuza is a way for a younger member to address someone he looks up to and considers their superior. I won't be doing it a lot, but since there's a few Japanese terms kept in a dub that aren't translated, I'll briefly explain what they mean as they pop up. Also, as it's not my native language, and I barely have a grasp on English as it is, I'm probably going to mispronounce a few terms and names in this video. Heading with Shinji to Peace Finance, We'll talk to the owner and press him about the debt he owes for the loan the Tojo clan gave him. Y you Sorry I'm late. I'm Kazuma, an associate of the Dojima family. Uh, I didn't expect you to come, Kazuma-san. When you don't pay your debts, I'm what you get. T tomorrow I'll have the money by tomorrow. Please, I have children. I'm supposed to believe this shit as you're packing up, getting ready to bail out? I'll say it slower. Where is our money? I should probably get this out of the way now, but... But let's pause the story for a moment and discuss the quality of the English dub. Or lack thereof. Here, the voice for the dragon of Dojima is provided by Daryl Carrillo, who voiced Alex Mercer in Prototype 2, and who I recently found out was the voice of Jigsaw in the Punisher game I previously covered. Go watch that video, by the way. His performance as Kiryu is perplexing, to say the least. Hey. Reina, Oyabun told me to find Yumi. Yes? Have, have you heard anything about her? Part of this is because it's weird to hear anyone voice him, other than his Japanese VA, Takeya Kuroda. Ah, so the other part of that is that Daryl's take on Kiryu isn't inherently bad. Honestly, his gruff voice is great for our lead when he's being stoic, serious, or when he gets angry. It's just held back as he doesn't have the range to pull off the more emotional moments in the story. And because of the dub's script. For some reason, they really cranked up the swearing to 11 in this game. 
Like the word fuck and other swears are constantly shoved into dialogue where it isn't necessary. And it sounds really, really forced. Ow! Hey, the f you think you're doing? And just what the f family are you from, huh? Excuse me. Excuse you? No. F you. It's like a little kid trying to sound more adult and tough. Or like that trend mid 2000s anime had of doing the exact same thing to their dubs. Trying to make their shonen show aimed at kids appeal to older teenagers and adults. Yeah, the original Japanese version has swearing too, but it doesn't feel so excessive. And it's just so awkward to hear Kiryu say fuck every other sentence. Or things like bring that shit. Or some other questionable language that I'll play later when we reach those scenes in the story. There's only two other games I can even think of that casually drops so many F-bombs. Grand Theft Auto V, that doesn't feel out of place thanks to its better written dialogue. And that game with Mickey Rourke, Rogue Warrior, which has the same problem as Yakuza and is easily much worse than awkward. Quick side note, I'll be playing less cutscenes in full or censoring some of the language in them for this video, as despite how well my GTA V video did, your boy caught an L when it was demonetized for language like a month ago and I lost my appeals on it. Feels unfair it could stay up for so long without any issues, but them's the breaks when making content on YouTube. Appreciate all the love and support from you guys on the video though. This problem with the game's script ends up affecting just about every other character too, as I think some of their English voice actors aren't half bad. They just sound terrible because of the stupid things they're forced to say. The script also has the issue of leaving in a lot of Japanese terms titles and honorifics, but not offering any on-screen translation on what they mean. Which, if you were a gamer in 2005 with no passing knowledge of the Japanese language, might have you scratching your head on what terms like aniki or oyabun mean. I understand the intention to help keep the game feeling authentically Japanese, and as someone who's grown up watching anime subbed, these terms don't sound out of place to me. But it just feels very unnatural the way it's presented, especially when read out in already awkward dialogue by people who clearly don't have a grasp on Japanese. So yeah, I think Daryl Carrillo's take on Kiryu had some potential. He just needed better material to work with and more time to develop and grow his take on the Dragon of Dojima. Something that's evidenced in Yakuza Like a Dragon, which was released 15 years after Yakuza on PS2, which was the first in the series to get an English dub since the original game. If that's what you want, that's what I'll do. <laughs> the treasure you're after is right up there. I'm the dragon guarding it. So defeat me, if you really think you're the hero it belongs to. I didn't know this initially, as I played the game with Japanese voices but they actually brought back Daryl to voice Kiryu in the dub. Some of you might disagree with me, but he sounds a lot more natural in the role. His voice sounds a little older, but then again, so is Kiryu. And the overall line delivery is significantly improved because of the better script. It's a bummer they didn't keep him on for Gaiden or Infinite Wealth, as while I personally don't think Yang Ya's voice is as bad as others make it out to be, Daryl just feels a lot more fitting especially since he's around Kiryu's age now. Alrighty, let's get back to the story. I'm going to avoid critiquing every moment in the dub, but I will play some moments for a comedic effect or when discussing particular performers' takes on their characters. The owner of Peace Finance, Harada, is unable to pay back his loan, and despite begging for more time, receives no sympathy from Kiryu. Turning angry and violent, he reveals he hired some goons for protection and sixed them on us, taking us through the game's combat tutorial. After beating up Harada, Shinji will find the suitcase with the money inside that's owed to them, and the pair take their leave. The kid praises his Aniki for another job well done. Excited at the prospect that Kiryu may split from the Dojima family in order to lead his own family in the Tojo clan. Though it's not set in stone yet and he tells Shinji not to get his hopes up. The two will now part ways as Kiryu will head to a bar he frequents called Serena, in order to meet his friends while Shinji will go deliver the money they collected. Confusingly though, Kiryu stays in possession of the suitcase they grabbed from Peace Finance. Was it a translation error, or maybe they're each delivering different takes they acquired? I don't know, I thought it was weird. Taking the alley towards the back entrance of Serena, 
We get into a brief fight with a Yakuza from another family as he doesn't know who Kiryu is. The leader of that guy's family soon shows up to educate him, introducing us to one of, if not the most popular character in the series, Goro Majima. Who the hell are you? That was impressive, Kazuma-chan. Kazuma? Anaki, you mean... Yeah, Kazuma Kiryu-chan, the dragon of the Dojima family. It's been a while, Majima-san. Relax. I hear you're trying to start your own family. Oh yeah. That bar over there? That's where your girl works. I hear she's hot. Everyone's jealous of you. <laughs> I know I'd like to nail a bitch like that. I didn't bring it up earlier when discussing the dub, but emulating what Rockstar did with the GTA games, the English dub would hire some big-name actors to be in the game. First is Luke Skywalker himself, Mark Hamill, who, outside of Star Wars, had a big voice acting career, his most famous role, of course, being the Joker in Batman the Animated Series. And honestly, he provides the best performance in this game. As he knocks it out of the park as Majima, he brings a chaotic and over-the-top nature to the Mad Dog of Shimano, that almost matches the performance of his Japanese VA, Hidenari Ugaki. It's a bummer they didn't bring him back for Like a Dragon like they did Daryl Carrillo, replacing him with Matt Mercer instead. Admittedly, they probably didn't bring him back on as he'd be pricier to hire now than he was back then, what with his career resurging thanks to the Star Wars sequels. When asked about it, apparently Mark Hamill didn't remember voicing Majima, which might sound mind-boggling considering the popularity of the character. But in his defense, voice actors do hundreds and hundreds of one-off roles, and are usually only brought in to do a few recordings before they leave the project for their next job. Since Yakuza didn't have a dub for over 15 years, he didn't become a big part of the franchise like he did with Batman and Star Wars. So you can't blame him for not remembering after all this time. Like Kiryu, Majima is a part of the Tojo clan running his own family under the bigger Shimano family, where he doubles as its captain. Due to his unpredictable nature bordering on the psychotic, his ferociousness in fights and his accomplishments in the clan, he's earned the nickname the Mad Dog of Shimano. Majima is considerably more bloodthirsty and sinister in his debut appearance, which due to his lack of involvement in the plot, also adds some mystery to him and his motives whenever he pops up. Despite his limited screen time in this game, he still ended up becoming very popular with the fans, with future appearances dialing down his brutality and upping his craziness and unpredictability to soften his image. During his introduction, it's hard to get a read on Majima's relationship and opinion of Kiryu, as on the one hand, he almost kills one of his underlings for disrespecting the dragon of Dojima. On the other hand, Majima turns around and addresses him as Kiryu-chan, which can come off as condescending as the honorific Chan, is usually used when addressing kids or something a person considers cute, though Kiryu doesn't mind it and still addresses Majima respectfully. As the game, and the series for that matter, continues, it's clear they do mutually respect one another, and calling him Kiryu-chan is more out of endearment and the close relationship they have. I'd love to talk more about him, but I'll save it for the next time he pops up in the story. Quiet, as usual. Normal people don't come around because they're afraid of gangsters like you. So it's all yours today. Reyna, where's Yumi? Out shopping. We need to restock because you guys eat like wolves. Yeah, right. So what's the deal? You starting your own family? It's not up to me. That's Dojima's call. Sitting down for a drink at Serena, we're introduced to the bar's owner, Reina, voiced by Rachel Lee Cook, who you either remember as Lainey Boggs in She's All That, or as the voice of Tifa in most Final Fantasy VII related media before being recast and remake. Sitting beside Kiryu as his fellow Dojima family member and sworn brother, Akira Nishikiyama, or just Nishiki, who is voiced by Michael Rosenbaum. You know, Lex Luthor on Smallville and The Flash on Justice League. 
and as Nick, the boyfriend of main character Juliet Starling in Lollipop Chainsaw, which I've also covered before. Go watch that video, by the way. His performance as Nishiki is much better than I expected, and like Mark Hamill as Majima, is one of the standouts of the dub, which isn't surprising considering his stellar work as Wally West. Kiryu and Nishiki grew up together at the Sunflower Orphanage, which was founded and run by their father figure and captain of the Dojima family, Shintaro Kazuma, who was also in charge of his own family. Oh yeah, I should probably get this out of the way now, but in the dub and the original Western releases of Yakuza 2 and 3, Shintaro's last name was changed from Kazuma to Fuma. There's no official explanation why. It might have been a translation as the kanji in his name can be read as Fuma as well as Kazuma. Though it may have also been changed to avoid confusion with Kiryu's first name, Kazuma. Which I always end up forgetting is his first name. I'm just so accustomed to addressing him as Kiryu, it's easy to forget that's his last name. You know, kind of like in Yu Yu Hakusho where everyone addresses Kuwabara as Kuwabara when his first name is Kazuma, and because I know someone is going to mention it in the comments, the whole name confusion is because in Japanese and other Asian languages, names are written with your surname first and then your actual name. Typically, you would address someone by their last name in Japan, as calling them by their given name can be seen as inappropriate or disrespectful if you don't know the person or have a close relationship with them. For the sake of consistency with the rest of the series, and future Yakuza videos I'll end up doing, I'm sticking with Shintaro's original last name, Kazuma. Oh, and Oyabun means boss, and is how Yakuza address their family leaders or patriarchs. Similar to Shinji, Nishiki also believes that Kiryu is a shoo-in to become the boss of his own family, even if the Dojima family's patriarch has the final say and may not okay it. Sohei Dojima isn't fleshed out all that much in this game, but from what Nishiki says, he's a man far past his prime, constantly reminiscing about the glory days and now overshadowed by all the work his captain, Shintaro Kazuma, has done. Because of that, it doesn't matter how Dojima feels about Kiryu leading his own group, as it's completely out of his hands if Shintaro decides to make his recommendation to the top brass. During his introduction, Nishiki really does feel like Kiryu's younger brother, with the way he admires him and praises his accomplishments, though there's a tiny tinge of resentment too. While things are moving in a positive direction for the dragon of Dojima, the same can't be said for Nishiki, as he somberly informs Kiryu that his little sister isn't doing so well. Due to her unspecified sickness, she's had to have multiple surgeries to have it treated, her upcoming one most likely her last as the doctors don't believe she'll actually survive. We unfortunately don't get more time with Nishiki before the events that unfold next, but you can tell he isn't in the right state of mind as he wrestles with the knowledge his sister is going to die. Oh, you're here. Yumi. You guys already drunk? Let me in. Go ahead. Have a seat. <laughs> the depressing atmosphere is interrupted by the arrival of Yumi, the guy's childhood friend who also grew up at Sunflower Orphanage and is Kiryu's love interest. And if her voice sounded familiar, that's because she shares the same voice actress as everyone's favorite pot-smoking hippie Shandi the oh-so-lovely Eliza Dushku. We don't get much time with her, as she arrives just in time to lighten the mood and drink with her friends. Tragically, this fun and heartwarming little moment will be the last one the trio will ever share together. Waking up after he passed out from drinking, Kiryu will leave Serena and head to the Kazuma family office to deliver the money he collected. On the way, he'll briefly talk to an acquaintance of his named Tamara who works as a reporter for some magazine and who will introduce Kiryu to his protege, Aoki. Arriving at the family office, we're formally introduced to Shintaro Kazuma and his lieutenant, Asamu Kashiwagi. Shintaro is voiced by Roger L. Jackson, who was the voice of Mojo Jojo on Powerpuff Girls, and, as I'm just learning, was also the voice of Ghostface in most of the Scream movies, which is wild to me. Meanwhile, Kashiwagi is voiced by good old John DiMaggio, the voice of Bender on Futurama and Waka in Final Fantasy X. Damn the outfit! Those sand plastic grease monkeys! God, I want to do a video on that game soon. I brought it up earlier, but Shintaro is Kiryu's adopted father, who raised him, Nishiki, and Yumi at Sunflower Orphanage. In his younger years, he was a ruthless and effective assassin, but as a way to make amends for the lives he took and families he broke apart, he opened the orphanage. 
He commands a lot of respect from his men, is seen as the voice of reason and peacekeeper in the Tojo clan, and a much more effective leader compared to Sohei Dojima. Kashiwagi, meanwhile, is the stern lieutenant under him, acting like an older brother to Kiryu and Nishiki. He's not afraid to lay down the law and discipline those under him. Though you don't get that feeling from the dub, as John DiMaggio makes him sound like an unprofessional goofball. You know, Oyabun was once known as the number one hitman for the Tojo clan. Kashiwagi. I... I'm sorry. Kiryu will sit down and talk to his boss, who celebrates his adoptive son getting ready to become the leader of his own family. Their discussion is interrupted when a call from Shinji comes in for Kiryu. He reports that Dojima has snatched up Yumi and took her back to his office, with Nishiki chasing after him. Kazuma is concerned as he knows Dojima always gets any woman he wants, and is unsure what he'll do to Nishiki if he tries to stop him. I feel like he should be more concerned for Yumi in this case, but okay. He tries to formulate a plan to de-escalate the situation and try to save his two adoptive children, but Kiryu, unable to wait, rushes to Dojima's office to save his friends, but unfortunately, he's too late. Yumi, Nishiki. Arriving on the scene, Kiryu finds his patriarch dead, Nishiki having killed him to prevent him from assaulting Yumi against her will. While he succeeded in stopping him from going all the way, the experience, combined with Dojima's murder, has left Yumi in a state of shock. I know we're only 20 minutes into the story, but I need to stop the plot again to go over Sohei Dojima and his motives. As far as I can tell, there's never been an official explanation for why he tried to force himself on Yumi in the first place, outside of the plot's gotta happen. If I remember right, some info in Yakuza 0 that references the events that would take place in this game even says as much and claims he took her for unknown reasons. Ignoring the events of the prequel, which I'd rather not spoil and didn't exist when this game was written, Dojima is a very underdeveloped character. Outside of being Kiryu's boss and a man past his prime, the game doesn't really do much to flesh out his character. Which, yeah, I get can be tough when he's killed off at the beginning of the game, but considering a certain character close to him shows up later in the game, they could have done some work to expand on him through dialogue or flashbacks, which they end up doing with another character who dies. So all you can really do is speculate what his real motives were. Since Kazuma outshines him and holds more respect in the Tojo clan now, maybe he went after his adoptive daughter Yumi as a way to spite him. Or maybe he did it to spite Kiryu, feeling overshadowed by his reputation as the dragon of Dojima, and how his underling was getting his own family, and that his group would lose even more status and power without him. Or maybe there was no motive at all. Perhaps the old man was wandering around Kamurocho drunk off his mind, spotted Yumi without knowing who she was, and grabbed her because he can have any woman he wants, and was unbothered by the consequences. All we can do is speculate. With Nishiki having killed his patriarch and a high-ranking member of the clan, he's effectively signed his own death warrant, regardless if he did it to save Yumi. While he's ready to go down, Kiryu talks him out of it and tells him to take Yumi and run, reminding him of his sister and that he needs to be there for her after her surgery. Despite his protests, Nishiki ends up agreeing, taking Yumi with him as Kiryu stays behind at the crime scene waiting for the police, taking the blame for Dojima's murder. Cut the bullshit! I killed him. I had some financial trouble. Don't give me that bullshit! Date, that's enough. It's not enough! Cutting to the police station, Kiryu is being interrogated by Detective Mako Date, a member of the Homicide Division. Like a few other people hired for the dub, I was blown away to find out he's voiced by Bill Farmer, the voice of Goofy for like the last 30 years. Date doesn't believe Kiryu killed Dojima, 
picking apart his argument that he did it for financial reasons, as even the police know he was on the verge of starting his own family. His partner doesn't care if Kiryu did or didn't do it though, chalking it up to Yakuza business and insisting they just close the case and be done with it. Asking Date for a favor, Kiryu wants him to deliver the ring belonging to Yumi he had on him, to his patriarch Kazuma, and to let him know he's sorry for what happened. Sometime later, with Kiryu now incarcerated and sentenced to 10 years for Dojima's murder, Shinji will visit him and deliver a letter of expulsion from the Tojo clan, signed by the third chairman, Masaru Sera. Kiryu is left confused as to why he only received a light sentence of being expelled from the clan, as opposed to having a hit put on him. Shinji isn't sure himself, explaining he was asked to deliver the letter by Kazuma, implying Kiryu's adoptive father may have done something to spare his life. He's now taking control of the Dojima family after the loss of their patriarch and their best soldier. As visiting time runs up, Shinji has one last piece of bad news to deliver. Yumi has gone missing, with Nishiki and Kazuma working hard to search for her. Sometime later, as Kiryu's eating lunch in the mess hall, he'll get jumped by some other prisoners. After kicking their asses, his would-be assassins will reveal who put a hit on him. Who sent you? <laughs> Chairman Seta, the third chairman of the Tojo clan. What the hell's going on? Skipping ahead a decade, we've reached the end of Kiryu's sentence as he's being paroled. Receiving a letter from Kazuma, the scene shifts to Tojo headquarters, where all the leaders are gathering for a meeting. A lot has changed during the 10 years Kiryu has been locked up. The Dojima family was effectively dissolved with all of its members now a part of the Kazuma family. And with some new faces having risen through the ranks as well. During this scene, we're formally introduced to the other big player in the Tojo clan, and leader of the Shimano family, Futoshi Shimano, who's voiced by Michael Madsen. Uh, oh, you boon. I'm sorry. So, you're positive it was that motherfucker? Yes, sir. I'm positive. I see. Kazuma has returned. <laughs> hey. <gasps> oh. <laughs> Tell me. Did that bastard Kazuma still look tough? Yes. Man, I'm so thrown off by his performance as Shimano, as I think his voice does suit him, but at the same time, his line delivery is terrible. The guy's a great actor, but his line delivery for Shimano feels very stilted. And weirdly, I don't think he was just phoning it in either. There's this behind-the-scenes interview with him recording his lines for Shimano, and his body language makes me think he was enjoying himself and trying to put in a good performance. Like maybe the guy in charge of line direction didn't have the heart to tell him his delivery sucked, and he needed to do it again. Or he was intimidated at critiquing a Hollywood movie star for their performance. Michael Madsen sounds like he was really into being Shimano, and was hopeful that if the game did well in the West, that his character would be brought back for the sequel. Um, but I think somewhere deep down in the heart of Shimono. <laughs> Maybe he cares, but uh, I think uh, if the game works, perhaps uh, there'll be a new game called The Return of Shimano. I like the sound of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so do I. Considering what happens to Shimano, I wonder if he hadn't finished recording all his lines yet, or he figured the game could hand wave away his return somehow. That, or he was just trying to avoid spoilers. As the third chairman arrives and sits down with the other heads of the family, he reveals he wasn't the one who called the meeting. It was Nishiki, who now leads his own family. Who the hell do you think you are calling an emergency meeting, Nishiki? In the presence of all the affiliate bosses, I'd like to ask the chairman something. There's a rumor that our money in the Toto Bank all 10 billion yen was stolen. Is this true? Shut 
shut the f*** up. You there. If you're feeding us bullshit, you're gonna lose more than just a finger. Clearly looking to stir shit up and sow dissent in the clan, Nishiki asks if it's true that 10 billion yen of the Tojo clan's earnings was stolen from the bank. As for where he heard this, he says he was tipped off about the theft from Chirada, a lieutenant in the Omi Alliance. Referred to as the Omi family in the dub, they're based out of Osaka and control most of Western Japan, effectively making them the second strongest Yakuza organization behind the Tojo clan. And they pop up as antagonists in one form or another throughout most of the games in the series. Chairman Sarah confirms that the money has been stolen, pissing off Shimano and some of the other family heads, making things even worse as he brushes off their concerns and promises HQ will deal with the situation before ending the meeting. Shifting back to Kiryu, the letter from Kazuma explains how the Tojo clan has changed, how he can't be there to greet Kiryu when he gets out, but that he has something important to tell him. Kazuma gives him instructions to seek out a host bar called Stardust, and to speak with its owner Kazuki who will be expecting him. Arriving in Kamurocho, Kiryu has no idea where he should start looking for Stardust, and decides to look for his reporter friend Tamara for info. Talking to some of the civilians on the streets, apparently tensions are high at the moment with cops everywhere, as some criminal bigwig was just killed. In our search for Tamara, Kiryu encounters a man by the name of Punk Ass Abe. Yes, that's really his name. Dropping his punk ass, he tells us if we're looking for information to talk to Waoki, who's currently at Theater Square. He was Tamara's protege who was awkwardly introduced to us along with his mentor after Kiryu left Serena. Finding and speaking to Waoki, he reveals that Tamara died five years ago. As he refused to believe someone like Kiryu would kill his boss and began investigating the incident, one day he just up and disappeared and a week later they found him dead in the river wearing concrete galoshes. Most likely he ended up learning too much and got silenced because of it. Asking Aoki for information, Kiryu learns Serena is still open and owned by Reina. That all the commotion happening nearby is because a top member of the Tojo clan was killed, mirroring the events around Dojima's death. And finally, he fills us in on the location of Stardust, which is right across the street from Serena. How the hell did you miss that, Kiryu? We then get accosted by Yuya, a host who works there and isn't interested in dealing with Yakuza. Don't f with Kazuki-san! How many times I gotta tell you, I'm not Yakuza. You retarded or just deaf? F Whoa, Kiryu, you can't use that word. After punching in Yuya's face, Stardust owner Kazuki will appear and apologize for his employee's behavior, welcoming the Dragon of Dojima into his establishment. He explains that he was able to open his club thanks to Kazuma's help who dropped by the other day and asked him to welcome Kiryu when he arrived in Kamurocho. Kazuki fills us in that the whole commotion going on outside is because Chairman Sera was murdered the night before, with the killer yet to be identified, and the various families in the Tojo clan now fighting each other for territory. Oh, and quick little thing, remember at the end of the last chapter when those prisoners claimed they tried to kill Kiryu on the third chairman's orders, despite the fact he only expelled Kiryu from the clan? That plot point gets dropped and is never addressed again. The remake Yakuza Kiwami does follow up on it though, as Kiryu will bump into one of those prisoners on the outside, and he explains the attempted hit job on him was actually a way to protect him, as the act of killing Dojima and disgracing the Tojo clan would piss off a lot of people. So with Chairman Sera ordering a hit himself, it sends the message that he'll be dealing with Kiryu and that everyone else should back off. Otherwise, you'd be disgracing the chairman. Kind of weird it wasn't addressed originally considering it was set up right at the beginning of the game, but admittedly I ended up forgetting about it too. Kazuki goes on to explain how the Kazuma family became so powerful after absorbing the remnants of the Dojima family, but all of that came undone one day when someone under him betrayed him. Before we can find out who the traitor was, we're interrupted when goons working under Shimano arrive and stir shit up. After teaming up with Kazuki and Yuya to kick their asses, an old friend of ours reappears. I just realized, you, you're the one who was sent to the pen for killing Dojima. <laughs> this is gonna be a great gift for our Oyabun. Kazuma-san! <sighs> Shit! It... 
It's Tanaka! Shinji? What the fuck are you doing here? I don't think this is your territory, asshole. Next time, I won't be so nice. Our little buddy has taken a few levels in badass and has moved up the ranks of the Yakuza. With the Shimano family scared off, Kazuki picks up where he left off and reveals that Nishiki was the one who betrayed Kazuma with the help of Tarada from the Omi Alliance in order to start his own family. Shinji will speak up and reveals he's now a high-ranking member of the Nishiki family, put there under Kazuma's orders to keep an eye on him, and that Kiryu's sworn brother is no longer the man he used to be. Spoilers, his unseen, unnamed sister suffering from an unknown illness has died. Kiryu, unsure of what to think, wants to meet and speak with Kazuma, though Shinji says it's impossible as he's currently at Tojo HQ, preparing for the third chairman's funeral tomorrow. Well then, looks like we have no choice but to crash the funeral, don't we? Arriving at Tojo headquarters, Kiryu needs to meet up with Shinji who will help sneak him inside to meet Kazuma. It's a janky semi-stealth sequence, which first needs you to get past some patrolling guards, who must be extremely nearsighted or something, as all you have to do is avoid their direct line of sight to get past them. Afterwards, Kiryu will sign in so he can enter the main hall, learn from an attendant that they dropped their morning badge outside, get his hands on said badge, and use it to get past the guard blocking access to the back garden where Shinji is waiting. After beating up an Omi Alliance member who's there to prevent Kiryu from crashing the funeral, on orders from Nishiki of course, we'll make contact with Shinji and he'll sneak us inside to talk to Kazuma. Kazuma. Oyabun. Ten years. I couldn't do a damn thing. It was all my fault, Oyabun. You had nothing to do with it. You haven't changed a bit. Oyabun, what happened to the Tojo clan? And what the hell happened to Nishiki? He fills us in on how Nishiki changed after the night of the shooting. After losing Kiryu and Yumi and his sister, he became obsessed with rising through the ranks and despite Kazuma's efforts, his adoptive son became a cold-hearted monster. He then brings up the topic of Yumi, getting close to revealing something important about her before he gets shot from outside by an unseen person. The gunshot attracts the attention of the Shimano family and their patriarch, who think Kiryu shot Kazuma. Defeating Shimano's goons, Kazuma tells us to find Yumi and the 10 billion yen, before Kiryu jumps out the window to try and escape. After a very long sequence that has us fighting throughout headquarters and seemingly beating up every member of the Tojo clan, there's only one obstacle left before we're home free. Shimano. Kazuma! You won't get past me. Cue a boss fight. I skipped over it during his intro, but let's talk a little bit about the kind of guy Shimano is. Contrasting the fatherly Kazuma and the washed up Dojima, Shimano is defined by his ruthlessness and desire for power. Short tempered and violent, he has no patience for his underlings' failures, and will punish them for the most minor of screw ups. Unlike Kazuma, who got where he is due to his wits, Shimano is more straightforward, relying on his brute strength to get ahead. Reflecting said strength, he sports a large tattoo that covers his arms, chest, and all of his back with a tiger at the center. In Eastern mythology, tigers are seen as one of the four elemental animals, equal in strength to dragons and the yin to their yang, symbolizing his role in the story as one of Kiryu's biggest obstacles, and with the power to rival the dragon of Dojima. You don't really see that power during his fight though. He guards against most of your attacks, which is fairly easy to break through. And while his special move can do some decent damage, he has a long wind-up and obvious telegraph, so it's easy to get out of the way. The complete opposite of Shimano's fight in Yakuza Kiwami, which was this frustrating and drawn-out fight, especially if he didn't unlock the right move beforehand. His boss team Prey Me does slap though. Beating Shimano and getting the hell out of dodge, Kiryu will briefly see his old friend Nishiki on the way out. What should have been a somber occasion 
turned into chaos today when an unidentified male started a fight at the funeral of Masa Sera, the chairman of one of the largest Yakuza syndicates in the Tokyo area. We will bring you further details as the story develops. Escaping the Tojo clan with the help of Detective Date, he and Kiryu will regroup at a bar in Kamurocho called Bacchus. The last 10 years haven't been kind to the detective. Similar to the reporter Tamra, he knew Kiryu didn't kill Dojima and became obsessed with discovering the truth. This pissed off his bosses and earned him a demotion, being moved from homicide to the organized crime unit. And his obsession would end up driving his wife and daughter away. After Kiryu fills him in on everything going on with the Tojo clan, Date suggests a partnership. He'll look into the missing 10 billion yen, while Kiryu focuses on finding Yumi. With no leads on what could have happened to her, he decides to head to Serena and drop in on an old friend. Welcome- oh. It's been a long time, Reina. <gasps> Kazuma-chan. Catching up with Reina, she doesn't know what happened to Yumi, but about five years after her disappearance, a woman named Mizuki showed up one day, claiming she was Yumi's unknown younger sister. Which sounds a little fishy, but Reina says she bore a striking resemblance to Yumi, and that she had a flower tattoo on her chest. Mizuki would drop by Serena often, eventually working there until she quit last year in order to open her own bar, Aries. Reina never learned where Aries was located, but tells Kiryu to talk to the owner of a bar near the Millennium Tower. As with his connections, he might know where it is. Welp, back to Bacchus we go. On the way there, we'll get a call from our new pal Yuya. He wants Kiryu to meet his girlfriend Miyu, and asks him to meet him outside of Club Asia where she works as a stripper. This is one of those sub-stories I mentioned before that has some ties to the main story, and uniquely is one of the few that actually marks the location of the objective on the map which was probably the dev's way of telling the player to get it done now, as this sub-story is permanently missable if you don't do it before the chapter ends. Meeting up with Yuya, will watch his girl dance up on stage, and while she's got some good moves, the next dancer is a little more eye-grabbing. Kazuma-san, she's a guy! Beating up the hitman, Miyu will get dragged away by some thugs with Yuya giving chase, calling Kiryu once he's outside that he's at a go parlor on Park Boulevard. Once he arrives, both Yuya and Miyu are being held hostage now, the thugs from before revealing their remnants of the Dojima family, holding a grudge against Kiryu for the death of their patriarch, and resentful they got absorbed into the Kazuma family, they want him dead. Kicking their asses while they fail to avenge their boss, they promise this issue is far from over subtly foreshadowing a different sub-story that pops up later. Kazuma-san! Sorry I got you involved in this. You'd be better off staying away from me. I don't know what to say to you. Kazuma-san, you always keep all your problems to yourself. I can't even begin to understand what you're going through. Kazuma-san, um... I want to show you my appreciation, but all I have right now is this. What the hell are you doing giving him something like that? But Yuya... Lifetime free entry? Nice. Sure hope I don't have to bring Yuya along anytime I want to drop in for a show. Alrighty, enough goofing off. Time to continue the story and head back to Bacchus. Returning to the bar, the place is a bloodbath. As several patrons and the bar's owner have all been gunned down. Searching for clues, Kiryu finds a scared little girl hiding in the corner holding a gun. After disarming her, he asks what happened and why she's there. She explains she came to the bar looking for her mother, and that everyone was already dead when she arrived. Kiryu gets her out of that nightmare, and after saving a stray puppy that was being abused by some punks, she opens up and tells us who she is. I left the orphanage without telling anyone. So, you're saying you're an orphan, kid? You don't... My name's not Kid. What? It's Haruka. That's my name. 
What's yours, mister? Uh, <laughs> it's Kazuma. Kazuma Kiryu. Despite her search for her mother, Haruka gets distracted by the puppy they helped and begs Kiryu to find something for it to eat. After grabbing some dog food at Don Quixote, Haruka will go on to say that she's never actually met her mother. All she knows about her is from the letters she wrote and from her aunt Yumi, who would visit Haruka at the orphanage. Realizing she might be Mizuki's daughter, Kiryu tries to ask about Yumi before Haruka suddenly collapses from exhaustion. After talking to Date over the phone and catching him up on what happened at Bacchus, we'll head over to Serena and Reina will help out with Haruka by giving her some medicine. Waking up a little later, the kid's mind immediately wanders back to the puppy from before, who ended up following Kiryu to Serena. Getting more information from Haruka, she explains she lives at Sunflower Orphanage, the same place Kiryu, Nishiki, and Yumi grew up in. Confirming that her mother is indeed Mizuki, she unfortunately doesn't know the location of her aunt Yumi. Haruka did manage to find out where Ares is located though, at the top of the Millennium Tower. She'll tag along with Kiryu as he heads for the bar, and proves even more helpful by providing a pin they need in order to access the top floor. That useful bit of info passed on to Haruka by her mother in one of the letters she sent. Arriving at Ares, the place is deserted, with no sign of Mizuki or Yumi. The place isn't empty for long though, as a lieutenant of the Omi Alliance by the name of Hiroshi Hayashi arrives on the scene with a group of his men. Before they can state their intentions, Date will call up and reveal that Yumi is the one responsible for the theft of the 10 billion yen, as a ring belonging to Yumi was found at the crime scene, the same one that Kiryu gave Date 10 years back to give to Kazuma. And he also suspects she may have had a partner that assisted with the heist. After agreeing to meet Date the next day at Serena, Kiryu will confront Hiroshi and he reveals he's not after Yumi or Mizuki, but Haruka. Kicking his ass along with the rest of the Yomi goons he brought with him, the chapter comes to an end as we have another mystery on our hands. Mister, why? Why are the bad men out to get me? Why? Please tell me. I don't know. Not yet, at least. Back at Serena, Kiryu will update Date on everything he's learned about Yumi and how she's Haruka's aunt. Shinji will then call up and report that he's currently on the run with Kazuma. He's taking him to a safe and secret location as he has evidence to believe someone in the Tojo clan is responsible for shooting him. With all leads on Yumi and Mizuki dried up, Date suggests Kiryu seek out the help of a legendary informant, a man known as the Florist, though he's called Kage here in the dub. The florist is located in a place called Purgatory, which can only be accessed through West Park where a large homeless camp resides. Weirdly, despite being called West Park, it's actually located on the east side of Kamurocho, which is explained away as the city screwing up when building the park and naming it incorrectly on the map. Weird, but thought it was kind of funny to mention. Heading over to West Park, a group of homeless men will stop Kiryu from entering, until their boss radios in to let him pass sending another of his men to greet the Dragon of Dojima. Follow me, Kazuma-san. So, you know my name already. Welcome to Purgatory, Kazuma-san. Looking like a traditional Japanese pleasure district and built to cater to the rich elite, Purgatory is home to brothels, its own casino, and a fighting coliseum. It says a lot about this series and how absurd things become in later games, that a place like Purgatory existing and being hidden right beneath the city doesn't feel remotely weird or unbelievable. Entering the large palace towards the back, Kiryu will meet the man who built and runs this place, the Florist of Sai. Thanks to an extensive information network made up of CCTV cameras around Kamurocho, as well as employing hundreds of the city's homeless, the florist is able to dig up information on anything or anyone, for a price of course. He's willing to assist Kiryu in finding information about Yumi, Mizuki, and the missing money. In exchange, he'll have to entertain the florist's clientele by competing and winning in the Coliseum. It's fairly straightforward, just getting into three back-to-back -back fights. First against the Big Show, then a young Sagat, and finally the Coliseum's reigning and undefeated champ. For the past three years, this true warrior has been undefeated! 
Coming to you from the underground fighting pits of Las Vegas, Gary Buster Holmes! So, we meet again. Bet you wasn't expecting me, Cosmosan. You gonna squeal like a bitch, motherfucker. Since I was saving it for when it popped up in the story, let's briefly talk about the underground coliseum. While not immediately accessible after meeting the florist, if you come back next chapter, you'll be able to take part in the different tournaments that are available in the arena. Each tournament consists of three rounds, with no weapons or armor allowed, and no healing items can be used. Instead, you'll recover 30% of your health in between each round. As the story goes on and you beat tournaments, more will be unlocked, increasing the difficulty of the opponents, but also increasing the amount of money and experience you earn, along with higher tiered healing items and weapons. So while not exactly a cakewalk, especially at the higher levels, the rewards more than justify investing some time here when you can. A man of his word, the florist tells us what he knows about Yumi, Mizuki, and the money, which isn't much or anything we don't already know. Though he believes that Nishiki was the one responsible for killing the third chairman, and that an unknown woman approached him recently trying to find Haruka, though he can't confirm if it was Yumi or Mizuki. Their conversation is interrupted when Date arrives at the entrance to West Park, seemingly injured. Tracing his steps using the city's camera, they discover he was jumped by a group of unknown men, who took Haruka and shot him. Kiryu will rush to save Date from getting beaten to death by some of the homeless, before the florist catches up with him and tells him that they tracked the van with Haruka to a batting center. As he leaves, we learn from Date that the florist used to be a corrupt cop that was leaking and selling information to criminals, before he was caught and busted by Date, the guy disappearing for a while before popping up here in Purgatory. By the way, this is when you can talk to Komiki and start doing your training. Also, it turns out that Tamara isn't dead. He just faked his death with the help of the florist so he can work for him. Before leaving West Park, Date goes on to say that the goons who captured Haruka were all members of the Majima family. I was wondering when the hell he was going to pop back up in the story. Time to go confront the mad dog of Shimano. Long time no see, Kazuma-chan. Ah, delightful to see you. It just fills me up with joy. Face to face with the dragon of Dojima. We can cross swords and have a real fight, right? Kazuma-chan. You know what I mean, don't you? <laughs> this is the part where you're supposed to laugh! Laugh, you stupid mother Cut it out. Huh? Where's Haruka? Oh. Oh. Whatever. Go ahead. She's in that room there. <laughs> I told you, didn't I? Kazuma-chan. All I want to do is fight you, that's all. You can't be serious. But I am. I'm always deadly serious. Come on! <laughs> Let's do this. You think you can take me, Kazuma-chan? Get ready. To get up. Getting into another boss fight, despite being outnumbered, Majima's men go down fairly easily. It's him you have to worry about. He's the complete opposite of Shimano and fighting style. Moving fast, dodging often, and using a mix of kicks, punches, and his dagger to overwhelm you. Majima isn't insanely hard, but his fight does illustrate the issues I brought up earlier regarding the combat system's clunkiness. Due to how you're locked into your attack animations, Majima will usually dodge to your side after taking one or two hits, and hit you while you're still attacking the air, sometimes locking you into his longer combo attacks for more damage. The best strategy is to bait out his attacks and hit him when he's open, but this strategy guarantees you aren't going to be using any heat moves, as you won't get enough hits on Majima to fill the gauge and anything you do gain will be completely depleted by the time you get another hit on him, assuming you didn't come into the fight with some Tariners to fill your heat, along with equipping a weapon to use its heat attack. So, again, not a hard fight, just a frustrating one that can drag out if you don't know how to properly handle him. <laughs> like always, 
You're tough as nails. I knew you were, Kazuma-chan. But I'm not finished yet. It's over. Give me Haruka back. Fucking idiot! What? Die, Kazuma! <laughs> no! Oh, you boon! Why? Kazuma... ...is my friend. You stupid... Only I get the privilege of killing him! Majima! Oh, yeah, boon! Hey, call the ambulance! Hurry up! Yes, sir! I am! Oh, that Majima. He might be violent, unpredictable, and has an unhealthy obsession with Kiryu for some reason. But he's an honorable guy at heart. I kind of wish he had a bigger role in the plot outside of just fighting Kiryu, but what can you do? We're reunited with Haruka immediately afterwards, who reveals that she was set free by some unknown man while we were fighting the Majima family. Said man also told her to take care of the pendant she received from Yumi, and to tell Kiryu about it too, as according to him, it's worth 10 billion yen. Looks like we have a reason for why the Omi were after her at Ares. Something about that pendant will lead them to the Tojo clan's missing money. So I'm going to briefly skim through chapter 6 and go straight to 7, as this chapter is effectively filler and doesn't move the main plot at all until the ending cutscene. First, you help the florist's estranged son and his girlfriend. Then you help out Date's daughter, Saya, and try to get the two to reconcile with each other. At the end, Date is chewed out by his boss and taken off the case regarding the murder of the third chairman and the missing money. When the detective leaves, a man representing an unknown party wants Sudo, a detective in the Homicide Squad, to investigate what Date and Kiryu are up to. Seems we may have yet another group invested in this mess regarding the 10 billion yen. At the beginning of the next chapter, Date will inform Kiryu about a murder victim found floating in the river, and who matches Mizuki's description. Taking a look at a photo of the victim, both men are unsure if it's really her or not, but she does have the same flower tattoo. Said tattoo bears the signature of an artist by the name of Utabori, the same man who did Kiryu's dragon tattoo. With no other leads, he decides to drop by his studio and see if he knows anything about Mizuki. Speaking with Utabori, Kiryu shows him the photo of Mizuki's tattoo, which he says is a flower referred to as the Queen of the Night, a flower that blooms only once a year at night. However, it's not his work and most likely done by someone imitating his style. Looking like we hit yet another dead end, we suddenly get a call from an old friend. It's Nishiki. What? Yeah? It's been a long time, brother. How did you know I was here? When you have power, the information you need simply finds you. When there's something I want to know, I can get it in no time. Have you seen Mizuki's body yet? What the... I'd like to talk to you in private. Tomorrow, 10 p.m. at Serena. After agreeing to meet with Nishiki, Udabori insists on touching up Kiryu's tattoo before he leaves. Considering how large it is, with lots of detail and color, makes me wonder how long Kiryu was laying there while the old man worked on his back. I probably should have brought this up before when discussing Shimano's tattoo, but a good chunk of the designs that pop up in this series were designed by a tattoo artist by the name of Horitomo. And outside of just looking cool, do hold their own meanings and symbolism. Since Kiryu's name literally has the character for dragon in it, it was an obvious choice to slap it on his back. And with dragons representing wisdom, power, and protection in Japanese culture, it also suits his personality to a T. Horitomo goes on to say he designed the dragon to look like it was rising up towards the heavens as a good omen, and that the Sanskrit on the pearl it's holding represents Dainichi Nyorai, the guardian deity of the year 1968, the year Kiryu was born. There's actually a lot more to go into with this tattoo, especially in regards to what dragon it's meant to represent and why. But that's a bigger discussion that Japanese fandom goes into that my dumbass can't fully understand or explain properly. I do have a better understanding of the tattoo Udabori did for Nishiki, the carp. Like Kiryu, it's meant to reference his name. As in Japanese, colored carp are called Nishiki Goi. 
It also alludes to Chinese mythology and the story of the dragon gate that sits on top of a waterfall on a legendary mountain. Many carp swim against its strong currents, but few are strong or brave enough to leap past the gate, with the ones who do being transformed into dragons. Basically, through hard work and perseverance, one can become successful and powerful, reflecting Nishiki's desire to rise to the top of the Tojo clan and surpass Kiryu. It's also the influence for Magikarp evolving into Gyarados and Pokemon, and Kaido's Devil Fruit in One Piece. Like Kiryu's tattoo, there's more to it, but again, I don't want to go on for too long about a topic I only have a surface level understanding of. Returning to Serena and preparing to meet Nishiki, Haruka grows upset that Kiryu didn't take her along to help her find her mother, with he and Date struggling to tell her Mizuki is dead. It's all anyone wants. No one cares about me, do they? Mr. You just want that 10 billion yen, that's why you're with me! I'm sorry. I know it's meant to be an emotional moment, but man, I could never take that slap seriously for some reason, even in Kiwami. After Kiryu fails to convince Haruka to trust him for now, she leaves her pendant and runs off. After searching Kamurocho trying to track her down, we find out she's being held captive at Stardust, which has been taken over by a mysterious organization. The men don't spill the beans on who they are, they just want Haruka's pendant and will release her in exchange for it. After their trade agreement falls through and Haruka gets injured, Kiryu will beat up all the goons in Stardust, get the pendant back, and almost learn the name of the person who commands all these mysterious men, before the would-be snitch gets killed mid-sentence. Man, that felt awkward to say. It's impossible to discuss this scene since we don't know anyone's name, and they're literally referred to as mysterious organization when you're fighting them. Mizuki. Your mother? She's... She's dead. I'm sorry. I... I couldn't help her. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry, Haruka. Kiryu will finally tell Haruka what happened to her mother and promises to protect her, while Date decides to investigate a badge that fell off one of the guys they fought. Since Serena won't cut it anymore to hide Haruka, Kiryu asks the florist for his help in protecting her and he agrees, offering the pair a hideout to stay in at the homeless camp. Now, it'll be a while till it's time to sit down to meet with Nishiki, so instead, Kiryu can kill time bonding with Haruka instead. This is when we're introduced to the Haruka trust system. Sort of. As outside of Date telling you to take her around Kamurocho to cheer her up, there isn't anything in-game actually explaining how it works. Unless it was in the game's manual or something. As you take Haruka around Kamurocho, you can increase her trust and bond with Kiryu by buying items and food she wants, taking her to certain places to play games, or completing challenges she asks for. Depending on what you do, it'll raise her trust a certain amount of points, increasing in rank the more you do, and with her giving Kiryu an item each time it moves up. While some of the later items she gives can actually be pretty useful, it doesn't feel worth it to get her rank up high, as it's just too time consuming and a few challenges need a lot of luck and work to get done and fully max out her trust. After a mandatory bonding moment where Kiryu and Haruka will take part in some gambling, in a secret and obviously rigged dice game, it'll finally be time to meet up with Nichiki. Nichiki. It's been too long, brother. Reyna, give me a drink. Okay. It's been ten years since I had a drink with you. Yeah. I'm sorry that I didn't visit. I've been kind of busy. So I've heard. I... Kazuma, I need that ten billion yen. Give me that kid you've been babysitting, and her pendant. Before that, I want you to tell me something. Why did you kill Mizuki? That wasn't supposed to happen. Not you, me sister. I would never. Despite what we've been led to believe about the type of person he is now, Nishiki isn't twirling his mustache and flexing how evil he is to Kiryu. Instead, he comes off as desperate and a little regretful. 
explaining he never meant for Mizuki to get killed. A flashback showing him angrily gunning down his own men for screwing up. Partially because she was Yumi's sister, and he'd never do something that could inadvertently hurt her, but also because he was having Mizuki tracked and watched when she showed up in Kamurocho, believing that sooner or later she would lead him to the missing Yumi. Kiryu asks him if he hates him, but Nishiki doesn't know, just acknowledging that he betrayed his sworn brother and Kazuma. He also admits that he was the one who shot him, earning a well-deserved punch to the face from Kiryu, who angrily demands to know how he could do that to their adoptive father. Nishiki brushes it off, that he survived and knows Shinji is protecting him, thanks to a bug he planted on him. Picking himself up, Nishiki reaffirms his goal of taking over the Tojo clan, and that sooner or later, he'll get his hands on Haruka and the Pendant. While it's not perfect, and Yakuza 0 and Kiwami do a lot more to add to Nishiki as a character, this quick conversation does a lot to flesh him out. While there's bits of information missing, you get the feeling that Nishiki realizes his own scheme may have gotten out of hand, but he has no choice but to stay the course, as he's done too much and there's no going back for him now. But I see now. We are brothers no longer. Why did things turn out this way? Why? Tell me why! So chapter 8 is pretty short. I'm going to skim through the finer details of what happens to get to chapter 9. Before that though, this is when another Dojima related substory pops up. Meeting up with the florist, he gives Kiryu a letter that was left for him by Yayoi Dojima, Sohei's wife, who says she will be waiting for Kiryu at the former Dojima family office. Despite the obvious trap, he still decides to go and meet her. In a nice touch, a thunderstorm will be raging outside when Kiryu arrives, just like the night that Nishiki killed Dojima. Speaking with Yayoi, she expresses her disappointment in Kiryu for what he did, how she believed in him, and was expecting him to take over the Dojima family one day. She'll spring her trap and sick a bunch of Dojima loyalists on Kiryu, and after he beats them all up, she hits him with this question. Are you the one who killed Dojima? You took the blame for someone else, didn't you? Who? Who killed him? So if it wasn't obvious, she wasn't punishing Kiryu for the murder of her husband, but for taking the blame for the person who did it, and hiding their identity. Which neatly answers a question I've had for a while, and whether or not she and Daigo knew Kiryu didn't kill Sohei. I'm not going to harp on it for too long, but this was another opportunity to flesh out Dojima more, learn about what he was like as a husband, his relationship with Yayoi. Nothing major, but enough to understand why his men would want to avenge him, outside of being honor bound. Alright, back to the story. A bunch of street gangs blow up West Park and kidnap Haruka, under orders from Lao Kao Long, leader of the Yokohama Snake Flower Triad, who Kiryu previously crossed paths with in his younger years. Kiryu and Date will head for Yokohama to save Haruka, and the chapter ends with a cutscene that shows Shimano is behind this whole scheme. Collaborating with the Snake Flower Triad, they plan to leverage Haruka's safety to coerce Yumi into giving up the 10 billion yen. Then it's revealed that another person is involved in their scheme, Yukio Tarada, the chief of headquarters in the Omi Alliance. He's the same guy who tipped off Nishiki about the missing money in the first place and has now struck a deal to assist Shimano in seizing control of the Tojo. And in return, they would then serve under the Omi. How many, sir? Tell Lao Kao Long that Kazuma Kiryu is here to meet him. Unfortunately, there isn't anyone by that name in this establishment. Um, sir? Does using some random guy as a meat shield count as murder? Or does the Kiryu has never killed anyone meme still hold up? Also, was that guy even part of the Snake Flower Triad? I mean, that could have just been an innocent civilian who worked there and knew nothing about what was going on. 
No time to dwell on that though, we gotta save Haruka. After a very long section fighting the snake flower triad throughout just about every area of the building, we'll finally stumble upon their leader, Lao Ka Long. Haruka! I've been expecting you, Kazuma Kiryu. Let me see now. It's been 12 long years. Lao Ka Long, why the hell are you involved? I was hired by Mr. Shimano. He made it very much worth my while. Revealing that he's decided to backstab Shimano when he refused to pay him his fair share, he cut a deal with Nishiki instead and sold him Haruka's pendant. That said, he refuses to give her up, claiming that she's worth far more than 10 billion yen, failing to elaborate why before kicking off a boss battle. The beginning of this fight is annoying, as it's hard to even get close to hit Lao because of the reach of his spear. I'm not sure what the right way to approach it is, but I cheesed it by tossing a flash grenade I forgot I had this whole time, which did some damage to him, stunned him for a bit, and more importantly, broke his spear when he dropped it. I think I picked it up from one of the coin lockers, I can't really remember. From there, the fight isn't too bad. you use some swords for a bit and toss daggers at you, but he doesn't move around as much as Majima, so it's easier to land hits on him. Uncle Kazuma, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Aww, she called him Uncle Kazuma. That's so sweet and heartwarming. I don't think I could ever get tired of her saying that. Kiryu doesn't get to enjoy this reunion for long, as the police burst in, led by Sudo, Date's former pupil and the guy from the homicide division that was tasked with keeping an eye on him. He arrests Kiryu on trumped-up charges of kidnapping Haruka, but he doesn't spend much time behind bars before Date breaks him out. While cruising back to Kamurocho, Date spills the beans to Kiryu about his investigation into those shady guys who snatched up Haruka at Stardust. They're part of the MBI, or the Ministry Bureau of Investigation, some top-secret government outfit run by a politician named Kyohei Jingu. They're the ones pulling Sudo's strings and convinced him to lock up Kiryu. Date also reveals the dead woman found in the river wasn't the real Mizuki after all, just some other girl with a matching tattoo that Nishiki's gang mistook for her. There's also a separate sub-story where you can learn who she really was and how she ended up getting nabbed. Haruka doesn't get to celebrate her mother's survival for long, as the Snake Flower Triad have cut up to the trio. Cue a terrible chase and shooting segment. It plays like an on-rails light gun game, with Kiryu trying to shoot his pursuers and protect the car so it doesn't get destroyed. It's not hard, it's very clunky and long, mostly because aiming isn't very precise so you'll be taking damage as you fumble around trying to land your shots. Meets slightly more annoying towards the end with a few guys on top of a truck, who are tinier targets and will shift out of range in between attacks, forcing you to wait till you can get another shot at them. I get the devs probably wanted to do something action-packed, but I would have preferred a cutscene instead of this. After escaping the snake flower triad, Kiryu gets a voicemail from Shinji, warning him that someone close to him has been leaking his every move to Nishiki. It doesn't take long to find out who the traitor is, as with the floor's help and security footage, we discover it was Reina. Heading to Serena to confront her, the place has been wrecked, with no sign of her except for a letter. In it, she apologizes to Kiryu and explains her reasons for betraying him. She's in love with Nishiki, and wanted to do anything she could to make him happy and make his dreams come true, even if he only had eyes for Yumi. Realizing it's all gone too far, Reina promises to take accountability for what's happened in her own way. Huh, that doesn't sound good. Something Shinji immediately confirms when he calls in, as Reina asks Nishiki to meet her at Serena, in order to try and shoot him. She failed and escaped with Shinji's help, but he's hurt and needs Kiryu to save them, as the Nishiki family is closing in on his location. Unfortunately, we don't learn where they are before his call is cut off. Luckily, Shinji left a convenient blood trail for us to follow. And holy shit, it's a lot of blood. Like the trail leads to a building on the other end of Kamurocho. And once inside is another big trail of blood. Like I don't want to jump to conclusions here, but I'm having some serious doubts my little buddy is going to make it. Yeah. Fighting through several floors of Nishiki family members, Kiryu eventually makes it to the roof and finds Shinji at the mercy of one of Nishiki's men. While we arrived in time to save him, we were too late to save Reina. What the f***? you waiting for you dumb shit
China. Pull the trigger and finish the fucking job. Believe it or not, but out of everything that happens in this game, Reyna's death is where I spent the most time rewriting over and over what I wanted to say. And it's all because I played Yakuza 0 first, and got to see her character and relationships with Nishiki and Kiryu fleshed out more. When I reached this exact scene in Yakuza Kiwami, it really locked the wind out of me to find out that not only did she die, but that she was killed off screen. For someone who felt as close and important to our lead as Yumi, it didn't feel right to have her treated almost like a disposable NPC with her death. And that's where my feelings are getting mixed up. As without Yakuza 0, Reyna does kind of feel disposable. Despite her huge presence throughout the game, and all the help she gives Kiryu, she gets little focus and no bigger role in the main plot, until the reveal she's Nishiki's informant. And she never really gives us a reason why she's in love with him in the first place. It feels like that reveal should have come way earlier, and with her telling Kiryu face to face at Serena, in fact it could have been a good way to flesh her out, explore her feelings about what Nishiki's become, and it could have worked as subtle foreshadowing about her being the informant. For someone meant to be a close and longtime friend of the lead, I think she deserved more. But all we can do now is avenge her. Arase has to be the most annoying fight in this game, as this asshole is jumping around all over the place, only stopping to unload his pistols on you before scampering away. His gunshots can stun and lock you in place, making the first part of the fight a nightmare when you're trying to clear out the weaker Nishiki family goons. While his stronger attack has an obvious tell and can be dodged if you time it right, he has an obnoxious habit of jumping out of your field of view before doing it, making it hard to find and react to him in time. The only saving grace of the fight is that there's some healing items scattered around, and some objects on the roof you can hide behind to avoid his gunfire. While I remember the Kiwami version of the fight being much tougher, the clunky melee doesn't make this version a cakewalk. Anaki. I'm... I'm sorry. I... I couldn't. Shinji. I asked a girl named Akami. She's... She's my girl. Got it. Akami, right? Anaki. This is for you. Shinji. Shinji. Sh Shinji? Shinji! Oof. Yeah, like I said, I think Daryl Carrillo has the right voice for Kiryu. He just didn't have the range back in 2005 to pull off an emotional scene like this. With Reina and Shinji dead, we're stuck trying to figure out how to contact his girlfriend, Akami, and find Kazuma. According to the florist, my little buddy had a soft spot for ladies of the night, often frequenting a soap land called Shangri-La whose number one girl just so happens to be named Akami. Oh, and soap lands are bathhouses that also double as brothels. Oh, Shinji. My little buddy. I know you probably liked her a lot, and she was friendly and seemed interested in you, but that's her job. That didn't make her your girlfriend. Kiryu won't be able to get in easily, though, as Shangri-La only services elite clientele, so he needs to fork over 1 million yen to get in, or get his hands on a membership card. The floor says our best bet is to head to Club Shine and ask a girl named Jing Mei for help in getting a membership card. Skimming through things again since it's just a lot of busy work, Jing Mei asks for a fake passport. We head to Jewel to talk to Ayaka, the contact for a master document forger called the Counterfeiter. Kiryu gets kicked out by the bar's owner, then saves her and Ayaka from the Snake Flower Triad, and the owner reveals she was the Counterfeiter all along and agrees to make the passport. She also admits she knew who Kiryu was too, as she heard all about him from Kazuma, who asked for her help in creating a fake identity for someone five years ago. Giving the fake passport to Jingmei, she tells us she gave her membership card to some other guy, 
And finally, we go to him and buy it off him. Picking up Haruka, we can finally enter Shangri-La for an uncomfortable conversation. Um, excuse me, sir. I'm sorry, but you can't bring children in here. It's take your dog. It's a social studies field trip. This is unacceptable. The other customers might be disturbed. Yeah, a grown man entering a brothel with a kid. I kind of get why the other patrons might be a little disturbed. Finding Akami, we tell her what happened to Shinji and she actually seems sad. The two did have something special. And she wasn't just stringing them along to empty his pockets. Huh, guess I shouldn't have jumped to conclusions before. Akami goes on to explain that Kazuma was there but that he left with a trusted friend of Shinji's, Torada from the Omi Alliance, who is hiding him in his yacht in Shibura. As it turns out, Torada wasn't working with Nishiki or Shimano, but has been acting as a spy for Kazuma this entire time. Akami goes on to explain that Shinji told her that Nishiki wasn't just after the 10 billion yen, but has also been searching for the third chairman's will, which names his successor and the fourth chairman of the Tojo clan. Their conversation then gets interrupted when Majima decides to loudly return to the plot. Let's fuck this shit up! Mmm. You look delicious. How about it? Why don't you be my bitch? Uh, uh. Well... Huh? No, no. I, I have a boyfriend. I'm sorry. Majima, don't do it. Well then, you're an honest girl. That's rare. I like that in a woman. Now get out of here. It's not safe to be here. Move it! I never know what to expect from you. I like honest people, that's all. People shouldn't toy with others' emotions. That's the way I am. Is that so? We were rudely interrupted at the climax of our battle the other day. Why don't we pick up where we left off to see who's really on top, Kazuma-chan? The first phase of the fight is essentially the same as the last time you fought him. Made easier this time around as I had unlocked most of my upgrades and the Komaki moves. So I was able to keep up with Majima's speed and dodge around his moves. It's during the second phase things get trickier. Knocking Kiryu down into the dark basement. He'll periodically run into the darkness before jumping out to try and ambush you now adding a lunging attack to his moveset that can instantly knock you down. Still, he's fairly manageable. The problem is the camera, as it's constantly shifting around down here, making it easy to lose track of Majima and opening yourself up to get hit. The items scattered around should theoretically make things easier, but for the life of me, I couldn't pick one up fast enough before Majima interrupted. And I'm not sure if it's a bug or because a few objects are overlapping, but for some reason, I couldn't pick up items at all from time to time. It ends up being another fight that feels clunky as opposed to actually being hard. Kazuma, you're a hard ass. With Majima out of the plot for good this time, we can now head to Shibura and reunite with Kazuma. Once Kiryu and Haruka arrive, they're greeted by Chirata, who invites them onto his yacht. Haruka recognizes Torada as the guy who rescued her from Majima and spilled the beans about her pendant's value. Speaking with Kazuma on the boat, he gives Kiryu the lowdown on everything that's been kept secret during the last 10 years. Time for a big exposition dump. First is that Mizuki never actually existed. She was just a fake identity that Yumi had been using for the last 5 years, created with the help of Kazuma and the counterfeiter, which means that she was actually Haruka's true mother this entire time. He also goes on to reveal the identity of her father, Kyohei Jingu, the head of the MBI. According to Kazuma, after what happened the night of Dojima's death, Yumi lost her memory and disappeared from the hospital. He eventually found her at Sunflower Orphanage and tried what he could to help her recover her memories. 
Using photos of her friends in life, he realizes that Nishiki was the one who murdered Dojima after seeing his photo triggered Yumi. Due to that, he decided it was best not to tell Nishiki that he found her. When Kiryu asks how she ended up with Jingu, Kazuma explains that he used to be close with the third chairman, Sarah, with the Tojo clan secretly funding his political ambitions, which is how he met Yumi. The two hit it off and fell in love, eventually conceiving Haruka. Kazuma hoped this could be a new life for his adoptive daughter, and one that could take her away from the criminal life. Things started to fall apart when Jingu received a marriage proposal from the Prime Minister's daughter. Since he wasn't officially married to Yumi, she decided to leave him so he could follow his political ambitions by accepting the proposal. But since his political power came through marriage, he became ruthless about maintaining his image and status. Boiling over one day when he accidentally murdered a journalist that was looking into his previous life and ties to the Tojo clan. Chairman Sarah helped him dispose of the journalist, but that wasn't enough. As Jingo believed the only way he could truly protect himself was if Yumi and Haruka were dead. Sarah would hire an assassin to kill them, but Kazuma stopped him. The attempt on her life and Haruka's finally causing Yumi's memories to return. Kazuma convinced the chairman it was better to hide the girls instead, first placing Haruka in Sunflower Orphanage, and altering Yumi's appearance and fabricating her identity as Mizuki. And finally, as it turns out, the stolen 10 billion yen didn't belong to the Tojo clan. It was all actually Jingu's money. Before Kazuma can elaborate, Chirata comes rushing in to warn them they're under attack by the Shimano family. There's a few things I want to say about the big reveal, but I think I'll just save it for the end of the video. Heading outside, Kiryu will fight off some members of the Shimano family before outrunning some grenades and facing off against the big man himself. <laughs> what fun! We meet again, Kazuma. And Fuma. You sneaky fuckers. Shimano! Tirada, you pretended to betray Nishiki and take sides with me. But I saw right through your deception. I've been watching you the whole time. And? You and Nishiki. You left yourselves open. I'll take the girl, if it's all right with you. It's really a shame that you all have to die. Shimano! What? It's you that left yourself open. Fuck you! Hey! What's this shit? Oyabu! Kashu again. It's almost Christmas. So we brought some presents. Oh yeah. I completely forgot all about Kashiwagi. I think the last time we saw him was right before Nishiki killed Dojima. There isn't much to say about this last fight against Shimano. Since you get back up, you don't really have to worry about fighting his henchmen. He'll start with a sword but drops it fast and outside of a QTE, where you have to escape his grip before getting hit with a car, he doesn't have any new tricks. So he goes down rather easily. Too bad he's a sore loser. Perhaps uh, there'll be a new game called The Return of Shimano. While Kazuma managed to protect Haruka from Shimano's grenade, it came at the cost of fatally injuring him. Fading fast, he explains that Jingu was using the Tojo clan to launder money. And in order to take him down, he and the third chairman worked to steal the 10 billion yen with Yumi's help. Telling Kiryu to rush to Ares to save her, he also gives him the third chairman's will that names the next leader of the Tojo clan. With his dying breath, he admits one last secret to Kiryu. Please forgive me, Kazuma. I'm the one who killed your parents. It was me. The Sunflower Orphanage is a place where I send all the kids that I made into... Orphans. 
It doesn't matter. That's in the past. Oyabun, to me, you were my... You were... my real father! I've probably been a little too forgiving of his performance, but yeah, Daryl really ruins the whole emotional reveal of this scene. Also, maybe it's just me, but I never really liked the reveal that Kazuma killed Kiryu's parents, mostly because the series never did anything with it. Like, I get it's to show that Kazuma isn't the righteous and good person that Kiryu props him up to be, but since Kiryu never dwells or reflects on that, and forgives him as soon as he finds out, it doesn't really matter. It feels like the kind of thing Mishiki or Shimano should have told Kiryu way earlier in the plot, using it as a way to try and manipulate him and turn him against Kazuma spending a good chunk of the game doubting the man he looked up to, questioning his motives regarding the money and Yumi, until he confronts him to learn the truth and comes to terms with what he did, and learns to forgive him. But considering all the mysteries the game was juggling, throwing that in earlier may have just made things more complicated and harder to follow. And to be fair, Yakuza 2 does kind of do something like that with its plot, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Alright kiddos, here we are, the end of the game, and holy shit did it take much longer to get here than I was expecting. It's time to head to Ares to save Yumi, stop Jingu, and settle things with Nishiki once and for all. Just gotta make sure to grab a bulletproof vest before leaving, as we're absolutely going to need it. Oh, and we gotta fight like all of Kamurocho on our way to the Millennium Tower. So you ready for me? And step the fuck up. It's time to die. Haruka. <laughs> mommy? You're my mommy, right? Haruka. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for making your life so difficult. Mommy! Aww. It's so sweet to see Haruka and Kiryu finally get to reunite with Yumi. Too bad it doesn't last, as their happy moment is interrupted by a helicopter landing and the arrival of Jingu. It's been a long time. Yumi and Haruka. So you're Jingu. Hello. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Kazuma Kiryu. Too bad you'll be saying goodbye so soon. I've never been the biggest fan of Jingu, or the reveal that he was behind this whole mess with the money. I think it's mostly because he has so little presence in the game. We don't learn about him till like chapter 12, and he doesn't make a physical appearance until here in the finale. Jingu doesn't feel like a half-assed twist villain at least, as the building blocks that someone else other than Nishiki and Shimano was after the pendant, and the money were peppered throughout the game. He's just so one note, your typical power-hungry politician, a cliched mustache-twirling villain who will happily kill his daughter and former lover without a shred of remorse. Like Jingu was apparently a decent guy before he married the Prime Minister's daughter and then went corrupt with power, but we never actually see that version of him. Also, I have a difficult time taking anything he says seriously in the dub, since he's voiced by Robin Atkin Downs and all I hear is Travis Touchdown. Moe. Admittedly, my opinion of the guy has lightened up after playing through the series. As well, he feels weak as a villain. He isn't the worst this series has given us. After Jingu tries shooting Haruka and hits Kiryu instead, Tarada will show up to even the odds, only for his own men to turn on him. As the higher-ups of the Omi Alliance have accepted a deal to work with Jingu, now that he's done with the Tojo clan. He hasn't won just yet though, as Yumi thought ahead and reveals she's carrying a bomb threatening to blow herself up along with the money hidden in the bar and killing everyone on the roof. Her bluff is enough to cause Jingu to hesitate, letting Yumi and Haruka to safely withdraw back into Ares. Ready to settle this whole mess, Kiryu declares he'll stop Jingu, and we finally learn who Chairman Sara named in his will, to succeed him and lead the Tojo. I'll protect what Fuma Oyobun and Chairman Sara left behind with my life. I am the fourth chairman of the Tojo clan. Kazuma Kiryu! After a quick skirmish with the Omi Alliance, 
Date and Sudo show up to arrest Jingu on charges of bribery, possession of illegal weapons, and solicitation of murder. Earlier in this chapter, as Date was searching through classified files in the Tokyo PD database, he gets caught by Detective Sudo, who decides to team up with him as his own investigation into why he was being told to arrest Kiryu in the first place, led him to discover the crimes Jingu committed. Finally fed up with everything that's happening, Jingu orders his men to kill everyone, leading to a boss battle. Fitting the slimy and cowardly politician he is, he'll run and shoot Kiryu from afar while he sends his men in to handle the dragon of Dojima. This is why I brought up buying the bulletproof vest, as Jingu and a few of his other guys will be firing on you as you're fighting his commandos up close, constantly stunning and interrupting your attacks. But with the vest, provided you're facing in the direction he's shooting you from, you'll auto guard against all his bullets, making his fight a lot more tolerable. After clearing out all his men and knocking down the first bar of Jingu's health, he'll run up to the helipad above Ares, summoning two elite commandos to assist him. This portion of the fight is considerably harder, as these two commandos are much tougher, constantly put pressure on Kiryu to stop him from going after Jingu, and most annoyingly will get up after like 30 seconds completely healed after you beat them. It's not as bad as the Kawami fight where on top of all that, Jingu is tossing grenades that do decent damage and constantly knock you down, but it's still annoying. Since the window for when the commandos get back up is so tiny, the best strategy is to break away from them and run straight for Jingu, who you can comfortably get several hits in if you chase him into a corner where he'll get stuck trying to run away. Once Jingu goes down, there's only one person left to deal with, Nishiki. Nishiki! You finished? Now we can all relax. Nishiki. What the hell is that? A bomb? You and me. Don't be an idiot. No. I won't let you have the money. Huh. Oh man. Do you really hate me that much, Yumi? Arriving right on cue, Kiryu will try to get his sworn brother to give up his ambitions by revealing to him he was nothing but a puppet for Jingu. Nishiki already knows. He never trusted Jingu or anyone else for that matter. Not since he turned his back on Kiryu and let him take the fall for Dojima's death. At first I thought he meant he couldn't be expected to trust anyone's help, because why would they trust a man who let his sworn brother take the fall for his screw-ups? Though as Nishiki explains that he always felt like a loser, I think he ended up being resentful that he needed Kiryu to save him from his screw-up in the first place. That the only way for him to make it to the top and no longer be looked at as a loser is to do it on his own and without any help, instead opting to manipulate and betray others to prop himself up. Nishiki's need to be powerful was also fueled by his love for Yumi, and his resentment that she only had eyes for Kiryu. If he became the chairman of the Tojo clan, he'd no longer be a loser. Others would be forced to acknowledge him, and he could have whatever or whoever he wanted, like Yumi. Ironically, his ambition for power has slowly been turning him into the man he murdered 10 years ago. Sohei Dojima, despite being washed up and past his prime, was still a powerful boss in the Tojo clan. Those under his command were forced to respect him, and he could do whatever he wanted. Like going after Yumi, consequences be damned. Nishiki took the completely wrong lesson from Dojima's death, ignoring the fact that for all of Dojima's power and status, he wasn't infallible, and his actions did have consequences, which led to him being killed by one of his own supposed loyal men. I'll be honest that his motivations still feel weak, as a big problem with this game's writing is that Nishiki's change in personality happens completely off screen. Yeah, losing Kiryu, Yumi, and his unnamed sister probably left him feeling depressed, and like he was all alone, but it doesn't feel enough to push him to become this egotistical guy chasing after power. Also, his dead sister feels like a lazy way to create sympathy and justification for Nishiki's change in personality. Like, we never see her have no clue what her disease is, or even learn her name. She's more of a plot device than a person. They were going somewhere with him, but they needed more to flesh him out, which is probably why they did so much more with him in Yakuza 0 and Kiwami. I'll avoid discussing it until we get to those videos, but both games did a lot to make you sympathize with Nishiki, and understand how hard he fell. 
Yumi questions if he really would be happy with this life he's imagined for himself. That if he really wants to change his destiny, he needs to stop running away and come to grips with his problems. To accept himself and his own weaknesses. But he's not having any of it, and tells her to shut up. Since words aren't going to cut it, Kiryu decides the best way to knock some sense into his old friend is with his fists instead. Nishiki. What? I truly understand your pain. I lost the two most important people to me. You two. I can't turn the clock back ten years, even if I wanted to. I can't run away from my fate. That's why we need to end this. All right then, the final showdown. To settle this shit for good. Ah oh man, this final fight with Nishiki is so underwhelming. Like I appreciate that it isn't as frustrating as the Jingu fight. I was just expecting a little more. Majima and even Shibano were more impressive. Though well, maybe that's the point. Since Nishiki threw away those he cared about in his ambition to make it to the top, he would never be able to match Kiryu who worked to protect those he cared about instead. Or going back to the story of the carp and the dragon gate, since he tried to cheat his way to become the chairman of the Tojo clan by scheming, murdering the third chairman, and chasing after the 10 billion yen, as opposed to working hard and struggling to rise up the ranks. He was unworthy to reach the top and was no match for a real dragon like Kiryu. While he kinda sucks as the final boss, he does give us this gem of a line while fighting him. 10 years in the joint made you a fucking pussy! With Nishiki defeated, Yumi reveals she gave Haruka her pendant because she wanted her to have the most important thing she owned. Opening it up to reveal a picture of Kiryu. Aww, isn't that sweet? Though it also doubled as a key. By placing it under a scanner, it opens a large vault containing the missing 10 billion yen. Arming her suitcase bomb, she's determined to destroy the money, putting an end to Jingu's scheme, and the war for control of the Tojo clan. Before the bomb blows, Jingu reappears. First shooting Kiryu in the leg, before attempting to shoot his daughter again and hitting Yumi instead when she rushes to protect her. They're at his mercy until in an act of redemption, Nishiki rushes in and guts Jingu with a knife, determined to end the mess he started. I am going to finish what I started. No! Stop! Don't do it! Nishiki! Nishiki! Despite the entire bar getting destroyed, and being only a few feet away from Nishiki and the bomb, somehow Haruka, Kiryu, and Yumi walked away unscathed. That said, due to her gunshot and blood loss I guess, Yumi is still dying. Kiryu tells her he's been waiting all these years to confess his love to her, showing he still hold on to the ring he gave her. Yumi explains she got her tattoo to remember Kiryu. Like how the Queen of the Night Flower only blooms once at night, it symbolized her desire to see him, even if it was just one more time. Apologizing to Haruka and happy to finally hear her call her mommy instead of Aunt Yumi, she gives her daughter some parting advice. To never run away from anything, or else she might miss out on her chance at being happy. Sure is some solid advice. Do hope she sticks to it as she gets older. 
As Yumi passes away, Kiryu is surrounded by the police, but they stand down when Tsudo and Date show up. Having lost everything and everyone he's cared about, Yumi, Nishiki, Shinji, and Kazuma, Kiryu is willing to give himself up and get arrested. But mirroring what Yumi said a minute ago, Date tells him not to give up or run away, that he still has something worth protecting. Flashing forward, we see Kiryu running out of Tojo HQ, being chased after by some of its members before he's picked up by Date. He resigned his position as fourth chairman of the Tojo clan, choosing to leave things in the hands of his successor, Yukio Tarada. I know he was working with Kazuma, but you barely know the guy, Kiryu. I sure hope the decision to name him fifth chairman works out. Dropping off Kiryu and Kamarocho, he says his goodbyes to Date and his old life as a Yakuza, having found a new purpose in life. All the battles have ended, a new legend is born, and it starts over for two people. A new journey. And that was the original Yakuza. So, what did I think? Well, similar to when I revisited Grand Theft Auto 3, it was great to see how this series started, and see the foundation it would set for the games that would follow it. While I think it holds up okay, it does feel like its mechanics have aged quite a lot. The combat system was too clunky. The heat bar and moves felt too limited, and the inventory was way too small. With the item boxes too inconvenient to run to and empty when you're carrying, while I enjoyed the story and the twists that appear do have some proper setup and foreshadowing, many of the characters feel lacking and underdeveloped, or don't have enough of a presence in the plot. The English dub is awful, while I like a few voices. As a whole, the terrible line deliveries, miscastings, bad audio mixing, and terrible script really does make it hard to get through or take seriously. It's a game I think is worth playing, but definitely not as your first Yakuza game. Admittedly, the remake does have its own issues, but I think it's a much better starting point to experience the series. That or Yakuza 0. Being a prequel, you don't have to worry about the baggage of what happens in all the other games, and while you miss a lot of things it's alluding to, it still feels safe and an excellent representation of how great this franchise is. Yakuza is an amazing series. It has a lot of ups and downs for sure, but I'm glad I've been able to enjoy that journey and hope to continue discussing more of its games in the series with all of you. And that's the video. Thanks for watching, guys. Oof. So once again, things uh, kind of got out of hand while working on this video. I knew from the beginning that I had to do a lot of work with my script, as I wanted to cover as much as I could and really do this series justice. I was constantly going back to rewrite things over and over, as there were a lot of parts where I either forgot something, got something wrong, or didn't feel like I said enough. I'm still not confident that the end product is as perfect as I want it to be, but I'm hoping you guys enjoyed it all the same, and I can continue to do better as I cover the series. Next video is going to be on Watch Dogs, and then Sleeping Dogs to close out the year. When the GTA 6 trailer drops, I might make some kind of analysis video on it, though that depends if there's enough shown in the trailer to make a video on it. I'm not a reaction scream into a mic kind of YouTuber, so if the video is just a minute of the new protagonist speaking over clips of the new location, I may not do much outside of a community post. But who knows, we'll see. I'll definitely review the full game when it comes out, just won't do my longer mission by mission style of video until sometime after its release. I'm mulling over some big changes as we enter the new year, so hopefully I'll be able to stick to a better release schedule and take more chances on different games and genres I want to review, and hopefully most of you will be on board to watch it. Thanks again for getting us to 50k subscribers. That was my personal goal to reach this year and I'm happy we got there with a month left to go. It feels so unreal to see that number on my channel, especially when I struggled to get 100 subs during my first year. Now I've grown so big and done so well that I can seriously consider doing this as my full-time job. And it's thanks to all of you watching and supporting me. Thanks everyone. I'm going to take a day off to recharge and then start on Watch Dogs. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.